Es ist, als würde jemand den Stecker ziehen. It's like the plug's been pulled. The switch has just been turned off. Stell dir vor, du standest Imagine gerade. being at the amusement park and suddenly there's just noise. All the lights go out. The carousel stops. The music disappears. You're disoriented and you fall. Du fällst. And you can't do anything about it. Und es gibt nichts, was du dagegen tun kannst. Ich fühle mich wirklich todkrank und schon seit acht Jahren. I felt deathly ill for eight years. I know my body has changed and this condition is now irreversible. In the evenings, I often sit in despair, telling my boyfriend that I can't understand why nobody can find anything. An schlechten Tagen komme ich nicht mal aus dem Bett raus. Ich weiß, meine When it's bad, I can't even get out of bed. I know my legs should react. There is no paralysis. But I can't find the energy to swing my legs out of the bed. I'm short of breath. I don't have the strength to use my lungs. I can't even complete a sentence without taking a breath. Den Satz dann fortführen zu können. Natürlich fehlt einem schon irgendwo ein Stück Leben. Of course, there's a piece of life missing, especially when you see what others my age are doing. It hasn't affected me as badly yet, but I still have bad days where I can hardly move. My whole body hurts, and it makes me afraid that it will become a permanent condition. Eileen Brown, Ralf Lipke, and Sonia Cole, three of over 100 patients who answered our request for interviews with the German ME-CFS Society. They were all willing to tell us their personal stories. The strong response makes it clear just how much suffering and despair the disease has caused them. We begin our investigation at the Charité Hospital in Berlin. Carmen Scheibenbogen has been researching ME-CFS for years. I come from the oncology. My background is in oncology, and in 2020, technology has now allowed us to get a detailed understanding of so many disease mechanisms that we can use them for specific treatments. This also applies to neurology. But with this disease, we know about it as much as we did others 30 or 40 years ago. The overall number of scientists working on this disease worldwide is very small in relation to the disease's frequency. 17 to 24 million people suffer from ME-CFS around the world. In Germany, an estimated 300,000 and in France around 250,000. Women are more frequently affected than men. Scientists assume that at most only half of those affected have been diagnosed. Mostly I'm disappointed. I'd never imagined that I could be left so alone with this illness. There's not only a lack of interest, but a lack of understanding. When you speak to politicians, they think you're just an isolated case. But you're not. And the worst thing is that you gradually disappear. In 2018, my neighbors thought I had moved away. Heute ist der 26. Oktober. 
Today's the 26th of October, and I've been getting progressively worse since last night. I couldn't do much today and spent most of the day lying down. Even the slightest exertion was too much. MECFS stands for myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, a complicated name for a complicated illness. The term myalgic refers to muscle and encephalomyelitis is an inflammation of the brain and spinal cord. The term is unfortunate because in most patients there is no evidence of inflammation in the classical sense. There was an attempt to give it a more appropriate name in 2015. Systemic exertion intolerance disease. It's cumbersome, but it better describes the core problem. Those who suffer from this illness have very low energy reserves and can no longer tolerate exertion. There are completely inexplicable physical reactions. Your bones hurt so much that you can't get up in the morning. Like the flu, you feel weak, feverish, your muscles ache. I used to be active, very active. And not just as a police officer on the street making arrests, even when things got rough. My private life was also very active. That just disappears. Eileen got mononucleosis two years ago, and she hasn't been the same since. She can only occasionally go to school. Her parents are mystified by what's happened to their daughter. She always used to go out with her friends. She just exercised all the time. She used to work out here at home too. But she can't dance anymore. It's really bad. As a parent, you're helpless if you don't know what's causing it and what you can do to help. You try to be encouraging and say, come on, let's go outside. Let's take the dog out. Come with us. No, I can't. I don't want to. It can be a bit much. If I had to describe what the illness feels like, I'd compare it to a battery. A healthy person gets up in the morning with 100% and uses it up over the day. In the evening, they go to bed and it recharges overnight so they can start the next day with a full battery. It doesn't work like that for us. We only have a few percent to get through the day. Overnight or during rest periods, our batteries don't really recharge at all. We always have to work with only a few percent in our batteries. Our bodies are undersupplied. We just don't have enough energy. Sonia Cole, a former communications designer, also caught mononucleosis. Even though she recovered, she caught a number of viral infections in 2012 and hasn't been healthy since. Long in-person interviews are too strenuous. So we do the in-depth interviews later over the internet. Could you briefly describe your symptoms? What are the disease's symptoms? More and more symptoms emerged over the years. I kept getting salivary gland infections and deer infections. In 2015, I was in the hospital three times with really serious bowel problems. Bronchitis, a burning in the lungs wouldn't go away, and I went from one doctor to the next. I saw a neurologist in 2016 or 2017, and he just took one look at my medical file, saw how thick it was, and said, I don't even need to see it. I can tell it's psychosomatic. 
Most doctors are unaware of the disease, even though it was included in the International Classification of Neurological Diseases by the World Health Organization in 1969. Even today, those affected are wrongly diagnosed as suffering from depression or mental illness. I went to see my doctor, described my symptoms, and told him how I was feeling. But he didn't know what it was either, and eventually said my stomach was the problem. I've been to various alternative medical practitioners, but they couldn't help me either. We've tried a lot, but no one could tell us what's wrong. Since no doctors could help, Eileen searched on the internet herself and came across a research project at the Technical University of Munich and the Helmholtz Center. Ute Behrens conducted a broad study at the center on mononucleosis. She met young people who did not fully recover after the infection and went on to develop MECFS. Very few scientists around the world are researching MECFS in children and adolescents. In Germany, she's the first. The trigger we can characterize best is indeed infection, or infections with various pathogens. These are mainly viral pathogens, for example, the Epstein-Barr virus or the SARS virus, but also enteroviruses. Bacteria as well in isolated cases. Accidents and surgery have also been described as a trigger. However, these cases are not as well understood as cases triggered by infections in healthy people. Then they appear as excessive immune reactions. More than 90% of humans catch the Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV, during their lifetime, usually in early childhood. The virus often develops without symptoms, and most have no additional consequences. But an infection can reappear as mononucleosis, especially in adolescents and young adults. Common symptoms are a high temperature, fatigue, sore throat, and swollen lymph nodes. Most fully recover. Some, however, suffer life-threatening complications, including respiratory disease, spleen damage, low blood cell counts, or long-term conditions like MECFS. An estimated 40,000 children and adolescents in Germany suffer from MECFS. A diagnosis is complicated. The disease has no biological characteristics that can be used to objectively diagnose an infection. Other conditions have to first be eliminated as the cause of Eileen's permanent exhaustion and pain. The internationally established Canadian consensus criteria for MECFS helps doctors reach a diagnosis. Neurological and cognitive symptoms, immune disorders, muscle and joint pain, headaches, and sleeping dysfunction. The best symptom for distinguishing MECFS from other CFS conditions is post-exertional malaise, or PEM. The symptoms worsen after patients exert themselves, physically or mentally, leading to a crash. Hello. Hello. Nine months after getting mononucleosis, Eileen was finally diagnosed with MECFS by Professor Ute Behrens in Munich. But what then? No medicines or therapies have been developed to battle the disease. Standard treatments tackle the symptoms instead. Besides the entire symptom-oriented treatment, including cardiovascular support, it's important to give patients good advice, to recommend relaxation techniques, and how to manage their very low energy reserves. They shouldn't overexert themselves, but also get limited exercise, short daily walks if possible, so that they don't lose what's left of their fitness. 
nicht die allerletzte Kondition zu verlieren. Eileen is now taking part in one of Ute Behren's studies. The professor and her team are looking at the course of the disease in ME-CFS patients. Eileen's pulse and blood pressure are taken regularly, and her blood is tested. Cardiovascular changes are measured during a standing test. Okay, straight legs and lean your head back. Are you nauseous? I feel dizzy. Would you rather lie down? The worst thing about this illness is that patients don't actually look ill, which is also a problem for research because the stigmatization gets in the way of both treatment and scientific attention. But at the moment, we are thankful for support from the U.S. National Institute of Health, the NIH. Thank God now a little more research is being advanced by the wave from that. But it's too little, with too little public funding. Food. In Germany, most of the patients are left to battle the disease on their own. They're dependent on private care from relatives and friends. Health insurance companies don't yet recognize ME-CFS and refuse to take over most of the costs. Patients are reduced to trial and error in hopes of getting their lives back. I tried everything, really everything. I was so desperate. I then happened to try an off-label drug, a medication that's meant for different illness, and I experienced what I now know as a crash. So I researched the medication and kept coming across an illness I'd never heard of, myalgic encephalomyelitis. And I thought, yeah, that's it. She read it and said, look, these people feel like I do. And she sent it to me. I remember that well. The article was very scary. And I kept wanting to leave as I read it. I had to get out of my office. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't think this would happen. Take a break if you want. Yes, a short break. On the one hand, I was relieved when I read it and totally recognized myself. But on the other, I realized that I'd been fighting it for six years and would be fighting it for a long time before I could get better again. And it's not even clear whether I ever will get better again. A process that began nine years ago with pneumonia. And in the weeks and years that have followed, I haven't been able to get myself back to where I was. I felt like a 90-year-old with a walker who can only go so far and no further. Ralf Lipka went from doctor to doctor for two and a half years. No one was able to find anything. Then his cardiologist pointed him to Carmen Scheibenborgen's outpatient clinic at the Charité Hospital. She diagnosed him with ME-CFS in 2016. Hello, Herr Lipke. Begrüße Sie. Hello, Herr Lipke. Good morning. Come with me, please. So, bitte, setzen Sie sich. Take a seat. 
So, we haven't seen each other for a while. How are you? Getting worse all the time, but slowly. Okay, still working? No, I'm on sick leave. Okay, and before that? Before that, I gradually moved from being in the field to desk work and then working from home. And eventually, even that didn't work anymore. Even with breaks, eight-hour days are too much. And you've brought me these results? Yes, autoimmune neurotransmitters. They are really very high. When I saw you first, they were elevated. But the values you have now are extremely high. We think these antibodies also regulate the body, and due to CFS, their function is disrupted. And this may mean that exertion can lead your muscles not being properly supplied with blood. You're quickly in pain, can't concentrate, and ultimately, energy production is also controlled by this system. It could be a major factor for explaining all the complaints of this illness. We still only have an incomplete picture of how this disease functions. What is relatively clear is that it's an illness where the immune system plays a significant role. If only because the disease usually begins after an infection. The infection ramps up the immune system and it doesn't return to its original state. We assume that this overactive or misdirected immune response then takes over the function of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system controls all the body's involuntary functions. Our heartbeat, breathing, digestion, and centrally, the dilation of blood vessels. If, during exertion, blood cannot flow freely through the vessels, muscle pain and poor concentration are the result. Not enough oxygen is available to produce energy. The beta-2 receptor is vital for blood flow regulation and is located on the blood vessels in muscles. It's controlled by adrenaline, which is released during physical exertion, as well as antibodies. In healthy people, blood vessels dilate to increase oxygen supply to muscles. But the Charité team found indications that antibodies don't function correctly in MECFS patients. Muscles don't get enough oxygen. Ralf Lipke's antibodies are being examined. We know the patient has antibodies against the beta-2 receptor. What we want to know is which part of the beta-2 receptor. We've divided up the beta-2 receptor into 15 small pieces and stuck each piece onto a different little bead. These beads all glow in a slightly different colour. And then we can see this patient reacts more to the front part, another to the middle part. We compare this with the reaction pattern of healthy people. This would help us understand the disrupted receptor mechanism better, and ideally we would see such a clear difference that we could use it as a diagnostic test. The blood taken from Eileen is to be used for further research. The Munich researchers send it with other samples to the Julius Maximilians University in Würzburg. Microbiologist and virologist Dr. Bupesh Prusti and his team are awaiting the samples. I personally am very fascinated to uh, search for uh, the infectious causes behind the disease. If at all, there is a viral infection being associated in this disease. And if we can find out this virus association, can be proof at the molecular level how the virus causes the disease. This will be really a, a big, big breakthrough in this field. And uh, if we can prove that uh, really viruses are responsible for the disease, then in a long run, definitely we can find a cure to it or a way to interfere in the process of disease development. The scientist has been studying the role of viruses in the human body for many years. He was the first to discover the link between the Epstein-Barr virus and MECFS. What we have found out that herpes viruses, particularly human herpes virus type 6 and Epstein-Barr virus, they are the most interesting candidates which can contribute to the development of the disease. We have found as uh, that HHV6 um, produces 
a small RNA and this small RNA can directly target uh, mitochondria to fragment and this is already known that in EVV infection also mitochondria is fragmented. So we believe that this virus induced mitochondrial fragmentation is one of the most important steps in the development of MECFS. Our physical and mental performance is determined by tiny little power generators, the mitochondria. Healthy mitochondria have a long mesh-like structure which is important for producing ATP, our body's universal energy source. When mitochondria fragment and lose their mesh-like structure, they can no longer function properly and produce energy. In his experiments, he adds antibodies from the blood of MECFS patients to healthy cell cultures he has grown. What will then happen to the healthy mitochondria? If there is a factor in the serum of MECFS patients which causes mitochondrial dysfunction, we expect that this factor will affect the healthy cells and the mitochondria will be fragmented up to different degree. The first results appear after between 24 and 48 hours. He's right. The mitochondria from the healthy cell culture have fragmented and broken down into tiny pieces. This is severely affected mitochondria. You can see that they are small pieces now. Yeah, they are not interconnected to each other. If you look into a healthy cell, you can see that the mitochondria are always like interconnected with each other, yeah? And this mitochondria is, first of all, um, weak in innate immune response. They cannot fight against any infections and uh, they produce less energy. Their metabolism is completely slow. This is how what happens in some of these severe MECFS patients. Bhupesh Prosti's research is groundbreaking and a possible explanation of why MECFS patients have low energy levels. But this process could also be used in diagnosis, which would be an enormous advance. We are at the very beginning stage of testing. We are still not using it as a diagnostic, but we are trying to develop this technique. So at this stage, it's very preliminary. We, we can get nice results with severe MECFS patients. Almost 100% always works. But with mild and moderate MECFS patients, it still goes sometimes wrong. So you still have to work on it. Yeah? But he needs funding for his work. And there are not any public funds available for MECFS research in Germany. Donations are all he has. MECFS research is insufficiently funded around the world. In the United States, for example, it ranks very low. US health authorities spend about $14 million on the 2.5 million MECFS sufferers. However, for 1 million multiple sclerosis patients, the same authorities spend $100 million. And for the 1.2 million people with HIV, 3 billion. The international hashtag ME Action Movement is fighting for more research funding, recognition of the illness and adequate treatment. They want to draw attention to the precarious situation of those afflicted. In her documentary, Unrest, Jennifer Breer shows hundreds of empty pairs of men's and women's shoes. They're symbolic for the millions of people who have disappeared from public life. As soon as I saw the film, I thought, I have to do something like that. I have to do something. We have to attack this at the root. With a handful or perhaps 10 people, we launched Millions Missing Germany and then planned and carried out our first events. Treatment in Germany for ME-CFS patients is catastrophic. 
They have no access to treatment, have to fight legal battles for every small step, like getting a wheelchair, and are sometimes even subjected to considerable stigmatization and discrimination. It was a very exciting time. It really felt like you could make a difference, could change something, and didn't have to resign yourself to your fate. In Norway, there are at least 15,000 people with ME-CFS. A Norwegian research team led by Ersten Fluger and Olaf Meller from Bergen University, has long been searching for a drug that could help them. They came across rituximab a few years ago by chance. They had wanted to use it to treat a cancer patient who was also suffering from ME-CFS. After observing at least eight patients telling us independently of each other about this uh, effect on the ME-CFS uh, disease, uh, then we decided to uh, try to do some research. And our hypothesis from the start has been that MECFS could perhaps be a variant of an autoimmune disease uh, with a role for autoantibodies and uh, B lymphocytes. Um, and that's why we decided to pursue the, the observations. B cells are important immune cells in our body that produce antibodies that destroy viruses and bacteria. Unfortunately, this process sometimes goes awry, and the B cells produce antibodies that don't work properly or actually attack the body itself. This occurs in many autoimmune diseases like lupus or myasthenia gravis. Scientists believe that ME-CFS is one such autoimmune disease. Rituximab is a medication which temporarily destroys B cells, preventing them from producing antibodies to attack a person's own body. In three smaller scale trials, they succeed in treating ME-CFS patients with rituximab. The scientists then initiate a double-blind, randomized phase 3 trial with 152 patients. Patients and their families around the world are hoping it will be the medication that can save them. I think the worst thing is the loss of control. And the more you struggle and fight it, the more your health deteriorates. It's like being in quicksand. The antibodies in the blood of ME-CFS patients seem to play a significant role. Ute Behrens and her team also want to discover whether they can diagnose the disease based on these antibodies and whether a marker can be found in the blood that could simplify the diagnosis. We asked whether the CFS patient had been infected with the Epstein-Barr virus at some point. If so, they should have a few green dots, and they do. This is a green dot that we also see in some standard diagnostic tests. And whether the unique signature which we see here is related to CFS, we can only say once we've examined a lot of patients. During our research, reports of the new SARS-CoV-2 virus began to appear exponentially. Worldwide, over 100 million people have been infected with the new virus. Weeks and months after an initial infection, many are still suffering with very similar symptoms to ME-CFS. Felix Monfeld, a neuropsychologist and musician, contracted corona 
in March 2020. He still hasn't recovered, suffers from permanent pain, cognitive lapses, sleep disorders, and extreme exhaustion. The weekend when it began going downhill, I just thought I had severe fatigue. I know the term, and I know that it's post-viral. I just googled post-viral fatigue without knowing that it's used as a synonym for ME-CFS. I saw that it was precisely these seemingly unrelated symptoms that I had. I couldn't have imagined an illness that's so bleak. It's as though you just don't exist anymore. After the first wave of the coronavirus, it gradually starts to become clear what an infection with the virus really means. Professor Carmen Scheibenbogen is worried. We think that around 1 or 2 percent of those who've had a mild case of COVID-19 could develop CFS. When we see how dynamic the spread of this virus actually is, there is great concern that we will have a significantly increasing number of chronically ill ME-CFS patients in Germany because of COVID-19. International researchers, including Bupesh Presti, are rushing to investigate the long-term effects of COVID-19. He doesn't think the SARS-CoV-2 is directly responsible for the long-term effects. He believes that latent herpes viruses in the human body are reactivated after a corona infection and, weeks later, lead to long COVID. Prusty sees a comparable pattern with ME-CFS, which also develops after a viral infection. If the signature of the serum that we are looking in ME-CFS patients are the same in these patients, at this moment we are talking that symptoms of ME-CFS patients are similar to these patients who have this long COVID. But we don't know it. It's just simply an association. There is no proven uh, um, data to say that, okay, a long COVID patient is now an ME-CFS patient, yeah? I left school and decided to do remote learning to finish schooling. I can do it from home. My school just wasn't giving me enough support. I would have had to continue to go to school normally, which just isn't possible. But since I've been doing everything from home, I definitely feel much better. Most families leave here with a new spark of hope after talking with us. We wish we could meet patients much earlier. We wish the illness's clinical picture was more widely known and that any patients who haven't recovered three months after an infection and show these symptoms would be referred to a specialist and begin treatment. We would then see fewer patients in such a poor condition. Millions of patients around the world are hoping for salvation from Norway. The results of the two-year rituximab trial are eagerly awaited. But then, disappointment. The trial is negative. Rituximab doesn't have the expected effect. It was uh, a bit unexpected. If we could have had a negative uh, trial, that is also, that, that, that can happen even if you have uh, uh, an active drug. But uh, not seeing a tendency in the right direction was a bigger surprise for us, uh, especially, as I said, based on our previous experience. On the other hand, we did changes in the rituximab uh, double-blinded study, for example, lower doses in maintenance treatment, which may have had an influence on this. So, Scientists had to halve the dose because they received no funding from the pharmaceutical industry. But the research continues. The hunt for other drugs that could help patients. They can use their research biobank with 3,000 blood samples, all donated by participants in the rituximab trial. 
if you ask me what we're looking for in the future, one thing we're looking for is a biomarker. Because a lot of patients do not have the ME-CSF di diagnosis because the practitioner, general practitioner or the specialist has problems and putting the diagnosis on the patient. But for research into both the causes of the disease and possible drugs, scientists everywhere need money. At least 40 million euros in Germany alone. The federal government recently set aside 3.7 million euros for research into patient care. A drop in the ocean. In my personal opinion, the only way um, we can find a solution to this disease is to bring patients, the clinicians and the basic science researchers to one umbrella. And our political system can play a very important role in bringing together these three pillars. If this happens, I guess in the next five to six years, we can have a solution to this problem. I've also had phases with suicidal thoughts. Of course I have. Would you want to live like this with no prospect of getting any better? Even if massive research was launched now, it wouldn't help me. But until then, I'll try anything. I'm not going to let this drag me down. If the disease wants a fight, I'll give it one. There are so few people out there who are able to fight for us, or who want to fight for us. That puts a lot of pressure on our shoulders. You put yourself under pressure because you really want to get out of here again. We all know exactly what we want to do tomorrow. If we get well again, 